Right, so I'm here today with uh, Sir John Whitmore, and Sir John Whitmore's been a, a friend uh, and a mentor. Many of you will know him for his work in the world of coaching and leadership, but there's many more stories to John. So what we're going to do today is we're going to give John the opportunity to share a bit more insight about his life. So John, welcome to Mo TV. It's great to be spending some time with you today to capture a bit more about you. Well, thank you. Yes. What would you like to know? Where would you like to start? Well, let's, John, let's start with, uh, I know you were born you know, just before World War Two. Yeah. Um, and that's probably a good place for us to start. So let's start with, you know, talking about your, your mum and dad and your family. Mm. What was your, your experiences like? Well, I was three years old when World War Two started, and we were living at that time in Essex, very near Tilbury Docks, which was very heavily bombed because that was where some of the food came into England from across the Channel or from wherever. And so there were very few children in that area. In fact, most children moved up to the middle of England or to the north of England. And so my sister and I were rather alone and um, we lived in an underground shelter every night. We slept underground, um, and that was, uh, when I say underground, it was a long way underground in concrete, you know. It was outside the house, it was about 100 meters from the house. And my sister and I just lived there every night, and we thought that was just life was like that, you know. What was interesting about it, in hindsight, is that my mother and father were completely dedicated to helping people in their situation, whatever it was. My father was head of the Home Guard in Essex, and my mother was head of the Red Cross. And the two of them spent all day in uniform, and they were out helping people continuously. And they were rushing around helping people, and very often they brought people back to our house and let them stay in the house because their house had been bombed. So it was very challenging at that time for them, but very exciting for my sister and I. <laughs> because, I mean, we thought it was a, sh a show for us to benefit from, you know. <laughs> Um, but it was very, very interesting to live at that time because what I saw was the purpose of life was to help other people yeah. and because that's what my parents were dedicated to. And uh, I think I've never really lost that because I've never really bought into the money game that now has taken over yeah. um, because I thought it, life was about helping other people who needed it. Yeah. And, and how did that early experience form your early education then? What was your, where was your early education? Well, we had a private teacher that taught my sister and I uh, only, and we sometimes had a cousin uh, from somewhere else up north that came down occasionally, and, uh, and she joined us, so we had a class of three then, but um, it was very much uh, just private learning in that way. And it was very often disturbed because we had these, uh, these warnings of bombing and everything, so we very often had to rush down and go down into the, into the hole under the ground and uh, that sort of thing. And I just thought that was the way life was, you know. I thought life was a permanent warfare. <laughs> yeah. And what was it like being mm -hmm. born into, you know, relative privilege? but being surrounded by people that were, you know, from a different world to your families. What was that like? Well, it was, it was strange in the sense that I knew that we were better off than a lot of people because, um, but my, my mother and father were just so dedicated to organizing other people. The other thing was we all had ration books and we had limited amount of food. Mm. And we, even though my parents could have got a lot more food if they had needed it from the authorities, they wanted to be an example. So we only ate the food that we got out of the ration book. Mm. So I did understand what the limitations were like. Yeah. and that sort of thing. So in very early life, I learned a lot of things from that time, and I'm, I don't regret having lived at that particular time. I learned a lot. Mm. And what were some of the key lessons that you learned from your mum specifically? Well, she was amazing. I mean, she was really extraordinary because she was Norwegian, and uh, I mean, she didn't speak brilliant English. But she had met my father on a boat going from Norway because my father used to go Norway uh, fishing. And so he loved Norway for that reason. 
uh, very strange in those old days because everything was, was three or four days on an ocean liner yeah. to get to Bergen in Norway. And, but on the, on the boat one time, they had some Norwegians and some English, and, and because my mother could speak reasonable English, reasonable, not very well, but she talked to my father, and my father said, uh, would you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had been married for 27 years first with a, a, a first wife who could not have any children, oh, right. and he wanted to have the, the rest of the family to continue, and so when she died, he decided to get married again. So he was 65 when I was born. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. And what about your dad then? So what were some of the kind of real lessons that you learned from your dad in those early years? Well, very interesting, very useful actually, because he was deaf. My, my father was very deaf on one ear because he didn't have an eardrum in one ear. And so I had to, when you've got a very high voice, when you're very little, when you're very small, um, I had to learn how to speak so my father could hear it. So I began to learn how to project my voice and all that sort of thing. It's very interesting now because I've been a professional lecturer in many conferences and that sort of thing. And I've had many, many people say, it's interesting because I hear you better than I hear most people speaking. And I realized that that was because my father taught me how to speak better. Yeah. And I ha actually do notice that uh, very many people are not very good at speaking clearly, normally. And that's just in their daily life. And so what happened to our schooling? Why didn't we learn those things at school? Mm. You know, we didn't. Many things we didn't learn at school. Yeah. <laughs> what was your early schooling and education? Now, where did well, you learn? What did you learn? We, we, we did a lot of things that I would say was just survival issues, you know, because although obviously mathematics and these things were, were part of the, what school was about, but what my mother and father thought, well, this is about survival. Mm. And so they were teaching us very much how to take care of ourselves, how to take care of other people if something went wrong and what to do with our lives if the house was bombed with my mother and father were killed in the house and we were in the air raid shelter. So it was very practical what we learned a lot of and I thought it was very interesting and very exciting. Mm. I mean, I really feel that uh, I, I had a privilege to being able to learn during the war. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and if we kind of move forward, to you know somewhat to your you know late teens what was your life like around your late teens early 20s well my my father was 65 when i was born he was born in 1872 believe it or not and he had not seen a car until he was 28 years old yeah. and um, he had lived on horses and we grew up with horses and i had my little pony when i was very small and was very economical for for traveling and we lived 20 miles from london my father used to go to london and on his horse you know so it was very uh, interesting about that way of life because he never learned to drive a car and was always uh, wanted us to be horse riders and we went hunting in the normal way and all that sort of thing. That was just life in the countryside. But then what happened was that I wanted to begin to come out of being this little boy who followed around behind my very important parents. I mean, I looked at them being so important because they knew all sorts of important people and that sort of thing. And I was just this very little guy. And uh, so what happened after a time was I began to realize that I needed to prove myself. Very often we, we work to prove ourselves to, to our parents, but actually what we're really trying to do is to prove ourselves to ourselves. Yeah. And so I wanted to do something that I could convince myself and my father that I was good at something because he was wonderful at everything and yeah. so was my mother because they had to be doing what they were doing. Yeah. And uh, I just happened at that time, you know, 17, I just thought I just needed to learn to drive a car because my father had a chauffeur, not a, a thing. So I began to drive a car and uh, so I thought this is something I could do because my father can't do it. 
So I want to do something that I can succeed in doing that my father does not do because I don't want to succeed because he told me how to do it. I want to succeed at something because it's my choice of what I do. Mm. And uh, because I was just beginning to learn to drive a car, I decided to use a car. I wasn't very interested in cars, but I decided to use that as a way of proving myself. And uh, so that's what I did. And I drove too fast on the road and I did all sorts of crazy things in cars and that sort of thing. And in the end, I frightened a lot of my uh, friends who rode in the car with me. And so they said, for God's sake, do it on a track, not on the road. And so I went into racing like that. But I wasn't interested in cars. I just wanted to be successful in whatever I did. And so that's why I went into cars. That's not a very crazy reason to start motor racing, which is what I subsequently did. And you were known at that time as the racing lord, I believe, weren't you? So tell us about that experience in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. Because I was very passionate about wanting to succeed to prove to myself and my parents, I was very, very passionate about it. So although I didn't really care about cars, I was very, very passionate about what I did, and I think that that drove my success in my early sports days. I was very successful in the early days, not because I liked the particular type of sport I was in, but because I was so psychologically passionate to succeed. And that dry, I could have done anything. I could have driven horses, I could have done something else, and I would have probably been equally good. Yeah. You know, uh, it's just that I was had that passion, and and I had a lot of very early success when I was driving. For example, um, my first race ever was in 1958, which uh, when I was that was when I was 20 years old. You didn't get a license to to race until then, mm. and so I was just 20 years old, and I got this. Um, this uh, opportunity to drive a, a road car in a race, you know, and I got excited about that, and then I did a couple of, of rallies and so on. But I was quite successful, and believe it or not, I drove in a, a car called a Lotus Elite against Colin Chapman, who was the person who invented Lotuses, and we both drove in the same race uh, in Silverstone. We had quite a close race. We were identical cars, two, two elites made by Chapman. But we, I did quite well and had a good race. He just beat me, but it was very, very close. And two weeks later, I had a phone call from Mr. Chapman is on the phone, my secretary said, and my, I was a farmer then, and my secretary and I, I said, is Mr. Chapman on the phone? I said, what is he? Uh, uh, is he selling seeds or what? You know? <laughs> No, he's something to do with cars. And I said, Mr. Chapman, do with cars. And I thought, my God. And I picked up the phone and said, this is Colin Chapman. But he, you know, I raced against you the other day and I, I thought you did very well against me. And we need another Le Mans driver, the 24-hour Le Mans race. Will you do it? And I couldn't believe this. I had not really started racing yet. I mean, literally, I'd done some club races and that was everything. And suddenly I'm being asked by Chapman to, to drive in the, at, at Le Mans, you know. And believe it or not, in 1959, I drove with Jim Clark, who subsequently was the world champion. And, uh, and we finished Le Mans in 10th position, second in the class, which was unbelievable. Particularly unbelievable, I will tell you this, because lotuses used to fall apart. The, uh, <laughs> Chapman, when he was making cars, he would make them very, very light, and they were very often not strong enough. And we had these two Lotus Elites in Le Mans, where both of them lasted for 24 hours. And people said, that's impossible. Lotus doesn't last for 24 hours. I said, well, it did with us. <laughs> so anyway, that was how I got involved in racing. 
And then, because obviously you won some championships, didn't you? What, you know, how did that come about? Well, it, it, yes, I mean, when you're that passionate about things, you just do very well. I mean, I just did better than uh, most people would have done, not because I was a better driver necessarily, but I was so passionate about wanting to succeed to prove myself. Mm. In fact, I won the British Saloon Car Championship in 19, what was it, uh, this, the next year after that. 60, yeah, something like that. I, I won the British Saloon Car Championship in a Mini, of all things, and that was what was very serious racing car, and, and uh, they were, and, but I won that, and uh, somebody came to lunch with us at our big uh, stately home in Essex, and, um, walked in and walked into my father's office and said, oh, your son is doing very well. And my father looked at, at, at him and said, well, he's not too bad at school. And my mother had never told my father that I was driving racing cars and I'd won the British Championship without my father even knowing that I was driving racing cars. My word. <laughs> what was the conversation like with him? Well, I, ne I never talked to him about it. I mean, my mother heard this going on and she came in, said to me like that, you know, put her finger up and said, don't tell my f your father. My father only lived, lived for another, I think it was uh, another about three months or something. And then my father died at 90 or whatever he was. Mm. It was about 90 when he died. And he never knew I was racing. Mm. <laughs> never knew. It was amazing. Yeah. And, and so how long did that, period in your life go on before you know you got to a point where you decided it was time to do something else I wanted to be successful I wanted to prove myself and my first thing funnily enough was I wanted to drive at Le Mans it was the big race of the year in those days it was more important than Formula One in those days and then I did that right away and I went before I even hardly started racing and so I, I won the uh, British Saloon Car Championship and then uh, from there um, I went. Uh, I went on, and, and I, I was a Ford dealer by then, actually. So I ended up having a contract with Fords, and uh, and then I won the European Saloon Car Championship in uh, uh, Cortina. A European Championship is as good as you can get, you know. And I then drove for Le Mans at Le Mans with Fords and everything else, and the GT40s and all the other cars, but. By that time, I'd done British Championship, European Championship, and, and Le Mans, and in the Cobra, which was also a Ford car, we won the, the World Sports Car Championship, but not as an individual driver, it was the team yeah. won the, this thing. And when I'd done that, when I'd been in that team, and now I had this, you know, Britain, Europe, and the world, <laughs> I thought, okay, I can quit. And I quit racing. I didn't need to go on because I had done what I wanted to do was to prove myself mm. to, to me and to my dead parents yeah. <laughs> that I could do things myself. And that was, it was very, very psychological. My driving force was psychological. Yeah. And so what happened? So you, you gave up. Well, I just, I just quit racing. Yeah. I just uh, said, well, that's it. I've done that one. Yeah. Now what do I do? I've been racing now, and I, well, I was now 27, 28 years old, and I've quit. What do I do now with my life, you know? Am I going to be a farmer? That's pretty repetitive, and that's a bit boring after driving racing cars, you know? So I wasn't sure I wanted to be a farmer. And I thought, I don't really know who I am. And so I went to Esalen Institute in California to learn psychology, to learn who I was because I had read in a magazine that this was an extraordinary place with very advanced thinkers in the psychological world. And I thought, I need that. I don't know who I am. Yeah. And I went to there and I, I learned an enormous amount by the psychology that they did at Esalen Institute, which was far more advanced than the stuff that was being done in the uh, academic uh, universities and that sort of thing. I mean, we were really experimenting psychologically and it was experiencing, not theorizing. We were actually doing the psychology rather than being theoretical about it. 
And I learned a massive amount. I mean, Abraham Maslow and people like that were just part of the, the game. We just played together, you know. So we did all sorts of uh, experimental things in classrooms, groups of people doing these experimental things. And I thought this is so important, what we're doing here. It's so advanced compared with normal psychology that I want to spread this out. I don't want to be just stuck in California. And so I decided to make a film on this that I could show around the world and say, this is the way we need to be in the world in the future. This is how we need to be psychologically. Mm -hmm. And that's why I made a film. And I made this 90 minute film that was at the Cannes Film Festival and went to Edinburgh Film Festival and was a very successful film. It was not a, a feature film. It was called an art house film. And it was, it was a specialist. I mean, you know, people who were really interested would go and see it, but it wasn't as just a, a, a fun show. It was a serious film in that way. But it was very well accepted. And, and Cannes Film Festival and, and all those things, they loved it. So um, that was another part of my life now, was I'd now become a filmmaker. In fact, at the Rotterdam Film Festival, they asked me to come back 25 years after I was first there. They wanted me to show the film again and talk to them about art house films because I was one of the experts, they said. <laughs> and I'd only made one film. Um, but that was really why I got into filmmaking. So, and now I had the, 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 the sport, I had the... Uh, the, the, the psychology and then the film and things. So I had a very interesting life experimenting with different things, not the least of which was surviving World War II, you know. Yeah. So it was an interesting and exciting and very challenging life that I'd had. So John, uh, you know, one of the, my favourite stories of yours was, you know, back in the 60s, I think it was, maybe 70s, when you befriended Steve McQueen and spent some time here with him. So t tell us that story. <laughs> well, it was very interesting because actually I was visiting a racing team up in the north, in Coventry actually. A um, person I was talking to, a guy called Marcus Chambers, who was the head of the Austin Morris team, um, and said, uh, I just had a call in London from somebody uh, called um, McQueen who says he's an actor and he wants to borrow a racing car. Have you heard of him? And I said, no, I haven't. And I said, well, I'm on my way down to London now, so I could go and see him if you want to find out. So anyway, I went down to London and went to the hotel where Steve and I met up then and uh, we got talking a lot because he was very keen on on cars and actually on motorcycles and that sort of thing. So we got into that stuff and uh, and we became friends. <laughs> One time he was coming down to my home, which was in Essex. I was living in in about 20 miles out of London in Essex near, near Tilbury Docks, as I mentioned earlier, was still there in that area. And he came down and I just said, well, it's easy. You just go down the A13 and there's only one uh, roundabout in A13. When you get to that roundabout, you go off to the right, and um, my house is about half a mile to the right, and it looks like this. So he came down there all the way, and he got to the roundabout, and of course I hadn't told him that about roundabouts, because it was the only one he met. And so he went the wrong way around the roundabout because I'd said turn right at the roundabout. Yeah. So he, he turned right. <laughs> so he went the wrong way around the roundabout and he met a Rolls Royce coming the other way with a chauffeur in it. And so he felt that he'd done things a bit wrong somehow. So the first thing he did in his typical way was to jump out of his car and run up to the, uh, the, the, the chauffeur of this Rolls Royce that was the other, coming the other way. And he got out his 45 gun and pointed it at the chauffeur. And the chauffeur put his hands up like this. And, <laughs> and, uh, and Anyway, Steve, when he got to my house, which was just a mile away down the road, and he told me this is what he'd done. And I said, for God's sake, don't do that near my home. You know? <laughs> but he was so funny because he did so many sort of crazy things in his life. He would do just what he wanted to do. He didn't obey the rules, and, that, and I think that's a very important thing in life. He was one of my great teachers in that way, and that happened a lot because the ability to do new things is very exciting, and uh, he was very much like that, and I learned a lot from him on the, on the, on the way. I told you I won the uh, 
British Saloon Car Championship in a Mini, but I'd won the, that, that um, possibility. I'd won that when I'd done 11 out of the 12 races. I already had more points than anyone else could get. Yeah. And so in, the, in my last race, I thought, well, I don't need to do this. And Steve wanted another race. And so I said, well, you drive my Mini in this last race. And so I didn't need to drive it because I'd already run the championship. And so he, Christabel Carlyle, and uh, Vic Elford drove three minis in this last race. And it was a 12 lap race, I think. They had a wonderful race and they fi finished very close together. And I gave the prizes away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was wonderful. We had a lot of fun like that. I, I, I mean, Steve was a very good friend of mine over the years and we used to ride motorcycles together in California and that sort of thing as well. And then very uh, suddenly he died of cancer, very sadly. Mm. Um, but he was um, a great person. I really enjoyed him as a, as a friend, and I learnt a lot from his way of life, which was very unusual. <laughs> so. And then, how did the the world of you know the ski schools, you know the sports psychology, and, and the world of coaching, which many people will know you for, how did you know from the Essien Centre? How did you bring it all together? I had a girlfriend at Ashland, and uh, she wanted to go to uh, Santa Barbara University to go further with the psychology that she was doing at Esalen Institute. And she and I uh, got in a relationship there. And then I went with her to Santa Barbara and I lived in that place. And so I was there for uh, one year while she did, she got a scholarship to a certain level. And so only needed one year to get her degrees at uh, Santa Barbara. And at Santa Barbara, interestingly enough, it was a very good place for sport because the uh, 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 Los Angeles is terrible for sport because they have this, this, this awful um, uh, fumes all the time because it's Los Angeles is surrounded by mountains and there's all these cars and everything in there so that's not a good place and if you go as far as San Francisco the weather is up and down but Santa Barbara is about 100 miles north of, um, uh, of Los Angeles and it has absolutely perfect weather for sport and the sports people used to go to Santa Barbara University because of that. They had very good weather all the year round for training. And there were two people who uh, were there that I met because we started talking about what, how we could train each other in sport because I'd been, a, I'd been a, a very good squash player at one time. So I'd been in sport and then, and then I spent a year in Santa Barbara at the university there and, and learned a tremendous amount from that experience again about about psychology and about where you go with these things. So I, I had a lot of learning going on at the same time. I, I mean, I used to go into the classes at Santa Barbara, but I didn't get degrees or anything like that, you know. But I mean, the early days of the inner game, as we called it, which was the beginning of coaching, was called the inner game with Timothy Galway. Um, that all started around that time because I met Tim and I met uh, Bob Kriegel, who was the skier and that sort of thing. We just played around with sport. Mm. And then how did, how did that world of the inner game suddenly start to flourish into this world of coaching that we now know it to be? Well, it, the word coaching, of course, comes from sport originally anyway. So we were just using the sports word for doing what we were doing. But we began to realize that because uh, we had all been involved with this very uh, advanced psychology stuff, much more advanced than the academia stuff, that this is what we needed to do. So we called it coaching because we were working with sport. Yeah. I mean, I was running, by then I had a ski school and a tennis school that I was running in Europe. And Timothy Galway was the head of the Harvard University tennis. Uh, and uh, then Bob Kriegel was a very good skier. So we all had got involved in each other's sports and that's what we were doing. We were using this in sport. Mm. But what was interesting is people who came on our courses, if we did a ski course or a tennis course or something like that, people would come on that, but they would come to us and say, we ought to use this with business. And they asked each of us, that was Bob Kriegel and Tim and I and everything, they asked us, can you come 
and work with our sports people doing this because we think what you're doing is very, would be very useful in the world of work as well as the world of sport. So that's why this word coaching went into the professional world of a thing. And I mean, I have to say that that's uh, how it all came about, mm. you know. And uh, so we took with us what we had learned in sport and we took that into the workplace. And that's what really set the workplace up the way it does. Mm. Timothy Galway wrote this wonderful book, The Inner Game of Tennis. The inner game being what's in the, inside you psychologically. The outer game is what you play with a ball and a racket. The inner game is your own game with your own mind and your own psychology. Can you win the inner game? And that will help you to win the outer game. Mm. And that's how it all came about. And you know, often yourself, Tim, uh, Thomas Leonard, uh, Laura Whitworth are sort of spoken about as some of the people that were early ambassadors and yeah. forefathers and foremothers yeah. of the coaching profession. Were you all friends? Did you all know each other at that time? Well, we just got to know each other because, I mean, I remember when we went on these sports events and more and more people came and then they would talk to somebody else and then people would come who... Uh, not necessarily business people, but they thought we were doing something different. Mm. And they were very interested in, in the difference of what we were doing. There was a lot of... That was the time, of course, also of the Beatles and all the... You know, it was all that period of great excitement there was in the world at that time. And, you know, the flowers and, the, and, the, and the, of course, the drugs and all that sort of thing. It was a very exciting time in life. So people were very interested in exploring new ways of doing things so there, be, there was very much openness and let's try this let's try that that was the way we worked in life in those days unfortunately as i see the passage of time we get more bureaucratic about the way we do things and and we don't have nearly as much fun as life was in those days and unfortunately i i, I love those hippie days as we <laughs> called it you know <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, your book is is seen by many as the, as the Bible of coaching. You know, it's it's probably the number one book in the world. I mean, yeah. how did that come about? You know, I I thought it was very important to spread this out, and that's why I was doing that from Esalen Institute and everything. Yeah. I I really believed in what we were doing. I mean, I, I was passionate about it in the sense that I knew this was right, and I knew this was where it had to go to get people to understand how to perform better. Mm. And it was very obvious that this was right, you know, and a lot of people do things that they don't even know that they're right because somebody has told them and that sort of thing. But we were very passionate about it, and I'm not, not just talking about myself, I'm talking about my, my wife at the time and then uh, Bob Kriegel and, uh, and Tim Galway and all that sort of thing. We were very, very passionate about it, and it was very exciting to be pioneering in new ways of doing things. And... Uh, unfortunately, I think academia has made it too bureaucratic in a lot of ways. I was disappointed that the progress in psychology did not continue after we left Esalen Institute in the same way. I mean, it was difficult to get people to enthuse about what we did very simply in, in Esalen Institute. It was just the way to do things. And then somehow people said, yes, but which is a typical English expression. They say yes, but, when they really mean no, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so it was very challenging, but very exciting. I loved life at that time because we were pioneering new things all the time. I'd pioneered new filmmaking. I'd pioneered a new sport, racing cars, when I'd never thought of it before, you know. That was life. Mm. And it was very exciting life. And I, I feel, to be honest, I feel that I have had a very lucky life mm. and there were great risks in it and we had a, when I was racing cars a huge number of people were, died in that period of the 60s because the cars were very fast but we hadn't got the safety things and that and uh, I mean there were a very high number of deaths and all that sort of thing but I would still say it was a wonderful time to be a young person at that time. Mm. I would never ever regret it. I feel grateful that I had the opportunity to live my life like that. And, and how did your kind of, your own psychological growth evolve? Because obviously I know you through transpersonal coaching. So mm. obviously you started 
you know, thinking about the SLN and then you, the GROW model, which is often attributed to you, and I know there's others that were involved, um, you know, but I know you through transpersonal coaching. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about that. Well, um, when we were at Esalen Institute, we were obviously we're looking at personal development because that's what we're doing with psychology. We're looking at personal development. But Esalen was so advanced already that it didn't limit itself to the sort of psychological theory. We were experimenting with other things and other people, you know, whether it was Carl Jung or Roberto Assagioli or these people were, were using new methodologies and that sort of thing. And inevitably, when you start going forward in psychology, the, the door begins to open to the spiritual world. And it was very, very interesting because all of us who were at Esalen Institute then, we were very open to the spiritual side, not saying, oh, this is a new religion or anything like that. It was just that we understood that this was a necessary part of psychology. And humankind has not woken up in that yet. They are still saying, this is psychology and this is spiritual and that's what you go to church for and you go to uh, academia for psychology and that sort of thing. I mean, it's crazy. All these things are interconnected. They're all part of the same thing. And when we divide it up, in which is academia does that. I mean, I think that academia has a tremendous lot to learn. I, I, I'm not complaining at the individuals who teach and that sort of thing. They're doing the best they can. But they do not have the, the openness, the broadness, the whole system thinking, mm -hmm. the contextual side of life. They don't teach that sort of stuff. And it's very sad to me that it's missing. I mean, uh, to be honest, the economic and environmental crisis that we, we have come into recently was absolutely predictable. Yeah. And I will tell you that I wrote an article in... Uh, 2005 or 2006, it was called uh, Denial and Demise. It's saying that things are breaking down and we are denying that. And at the time, people who read the article said, oh, this is a bit crazy. But very interesting because by the time we got to 2007, some business people, when I was doing some courses, would say to me, how did you know what you wrote in that article? I said, that is the wrong question. What do you mean that's the wrong question? I want to know, how did you know that? I said, well, let me ask you the right question. The right question is, how did you not know that? Because these were the bankers and they did not know that there was a crisis coming. And they did not know there was an economic crisis coming and it was perfectly obvious from Esalen Institute both the environmental things and the economic things were inevitably coming. And that just shows how primitive, and I'm going to say that, our society is. It really is primitive. If we had had the opportunity to progress in the way that we had at those times, I know the population is enormous and I know you've got to have bureaucracy to manage it and everything else. I'm not blaming individuals, but I'm very sad that humanity has not evolved in the way that it could have and should have done because we are now backward. Yeah, because I know you're really fascinated about whole systems thinking, as you've mentioned, but also the, the psycho-spiritual evolution and growth of the human tribe. Yeah. So talk to me about that. What do you see? Maslow talked about different stages we go through. Now, he was talking to, you have different needs at different levels and that sort of thing, but I, use, I think we need to use very simple models, and I use a nice simple model which relates to, um, to a child growing up, for example. It's a similar way because it's developing that person. The child is, at the beginning, they are dependent on their parents who look after them and everything, aren't they? They're very dependent to begin with. But then at the terrible twos comes the fight for their own independence because their mother says, do this, and they say no. And anyway, they, they behave like that for a bit. They don't get away with it. But that starts again at, at adolescent time. At the adolescent time, the young people fight with their parents or other teachers and say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do it my way. 
And that's very, very important. And what we do is to try to control that and not encourage that. We need to encourage people to go their way. We need to encourage people to be who they are, not just to do the same things that everyone else has done for generation after generation. We need to evolve ourselves and develop there. So the, the nice simple model is we start off with dependence, then we're seek, seeking independence, but then we have to mature to being interdependent, which means we are all dependent on each other collectively. And it's that collective level that we've not yet reached. Now, it's okay to be adolescent until you're about 24 or 25 years old, which is the time that you usually give up sport and then you start to do something serious, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's sort of okay. But if you are 50 years old and you're a banker and you're still behaving like an adolescent, you've got a problem. Mm. And that is what our society is. I see some sections of our society now, and I would say the, the financial part of it is one of them. They are adolescent in their behavior because they cannot think of everybody. They're all trying to com compete with each other, which is the adolescent behavior. You know, if we are going to benefit the world as a whole, which is my absolute passion, I'm working for the world as a whole, as I see it, then we have to be interdependent. We have to work together. And this consumerism and capitalism and that sort of thing is just, uh, it's, it's not interdependent. It's competitive and it's harmful in that way to society. So this is one of the things that I'm very, very passionate about trying to bring out into the world at large. And I've pulled away from coaching now, and I've moved more into global issues now. And that's what I'm really passionate about. And how do you see you know, the people that are joining and are part of the, the profession of coaching that you've been you know, uh, heavily involved with most of your life? What, what do you see you know, for them? What do, they, do you see they need to do to help this? Well, I think, I think they are by being involved in coaching because the product of coaching is to get people to be more aware and more responsible. Those two are the key words in coaching. Everyone needs to be very aware and that's self-aware and aware of other people. So they're aware of situation, they're aware of other people's needs and they're aware of their own needs and that sort of thing. So they have to be self-attendant in that way and then we have to be responsible we have to make our own choices and do the right thing be responsible and accept responsibility for our choices and if our society can only become more aware and more responsible it will get a better and better society and that's what I'm pushing all the time with my coaching book and uh, it's very widely accepted now in coaching in generally that awareness and responsibility are the two key words. You know, my book has um, seven or eight hundred thousand uh, copies in that, that coaching book, far more than any other uh, coaching books are there, and it's done several ed ed editions. I mean, the first book was only about 110 pages, and now it's 250 pages, you know, and it's in 25 different languages now. So I'm just doing everything I can to move us forward, but I'm not advocating everyone has to be a coach. No. I'm advocating that what we need to do is to be responsible, to be aware, and then we'll do things in an appropriate way. And I think we shouldn't get too stuck on the model that says this is a coach, you know. Mm. Um, I don't use the word coaching very much now when I'm talking to people who haven't heard of it before sort of thing. I don't say, oh, you must know about coaching. I'm talking about the people skills of understanding whole systems and how the world works. Mm, and, and how do you see people going beyond themselves, so from their own actualization to helping others to actualize. How do you see coaching supporting that? Well, journey? I see that as automatic. It's very interesting because in the transpersonal work, which is the more advanced level of the coaching we, we do, which is more spiritual, if you like, one of the things, the exercise we do is to say, what do we want you to do in this exercise? Is to imagine that you have a purpose in life. 
And what we're going to do is to explore if we can discover or help you to discover what your purpose might be in life. I have no idea what your purpose is. My purpose is my purpose and somebody else's is theirs, but we can all find our own purpose if there happened to be a purpose for everyone to have. So I'm not saying there is, but imagine that there would be a purpose. What would yours be? We then do an exercise with them exploring this process, and I'd, I'd love to do it with you, but it's going to take far too long to do it. It takes an hour to do this exercise. But what happens at the end is that people get much clearer that they do have a purpose in life. My God, I didn't realize that when you said, imagine you have a purpose, and then we went into this exercise, now I do actually begin to feel that I do have a purpose in life. And that sort of thing. So I've asked a lot of people who've done this exercise, and I mean thousands, literally thousands of people who've done this exercise. I said, I just want, you know, half a dozen of you in this seminar room today just to tell your partner what your purpose is. And then I want at least five of you to tell the rest of us, if you have the courage to do so, what is your purpose in life? You know, every single thing that people have said about their purpose is not my purpose is to become rich, become wealthy, become clever, be good at this, be good at that. No, every single person who has answered that has said to contribute to humanity in different ways. They have their choice of which way they can contribute, but it's always to help other people. And that took me back to my parents because that's what my parents believed in during World War II. Yeah. And so that all connected to me. That was such a powerful impact when I suddenly realized that really that is the purpose of life, is to contribute to other people. And um, it's very, very exciting. And the, the idea of this sort of uh, adolescent thing, the other problem around that is, is that what we need to do is to give our children choices so that they can at two years old say mom i want to go out and play you know and instead of mom saying no you can't go out because it's cold they ought to let you go out and when you're out there playing you may become cold and then you say to mom i'm a bit cold mom and then your mother doesn't say well you idiot why didn't you wear a sweater your mother said, well, what do you need to do? And you, the child says, well, I need to put on something else. And the mother says, okay, let's go and get you something else. So what the child is then learning is that they have make a choice to go out without a sweater, but the consequence is that is that they got cold. So the learning of life, the great learning of life that we all have this opportunity to do is to make choices and to experience the consequence of the choice we make. And we will therefore learn how to make better choices. Now, if you give your child just three choices a day, how many choices do they make in a year? Well, over a thousand. Yeah, they make over a thousand choices. How much do they learn about the consequence of the choice they make by doing that? That is something that's tragically ignored in education because education does not see evolution, psychological evolution. We talk about biological evolution. We don't talk about psychological evolution. And at school, they don't even talk about evolution. So there's a lot of things that were going on in our society that a lot of people know. More and more people understand this. I know you know these things, and this is not no, new for you because you're familiar with this sort of stuff. But there's so many people, including politicians and bankers and things like that, who simply do not understand evolution. Mm. You know. And, and what's your fear for the consequences if we continue on the same trajectory that we're on? Well, I think, I mean, we have to wake up. We have to wake up. But, um, you know, what happens when you put your alarm clock on? Some people want to throw the alarm clock out of the window and other people say, oh, I'm just going to work. You know, I mean, people react to alarm clocks in different ways. And I think it's very important that we, we even though we have to wake up 
and, and we need the alarm clock, so to speak. We have to wake up. Mm. I think it's very important to give people hope and encouragement. So even if we are going through a period of uh, slow evolution, it's very, very important to, to encourage people to say that, yes, it is coming, we are getting it, look what we're doing compared to this, and it, it is getting better in many ways. These people need some help in this country, or whatever it is, and that sort of thing. But we need to be optimistic all the time and keep positiveness, because that is going to bring change around. When people get depressed and say, no, this is wrong, this is bad, and that sort of thing, we won't evolve that way. We have to evolve by staying positive and optimistic. I am optimistic. I'm very excited about I've had a a fairly challenging life, as uh, I expressed to you in some ways, with the war and the tremendous number of people being killed in motor racing at the time I was and all that sort of thing. But I um, feel I've absolutely been gifted with my having my life at this time and having the type of lifestyle that I've had with, from which I've learned so much. I'm very, very grateful for that. Now I'm, I'm in my last stages of my life, obviously, physically. I mean, I'm, I'm 75 years old now. And, and uh, I'm really wanting to encourage people to take positive attitudes into the future now. And I think it's a very, very exciting time. Mm. And what's your sense of what's been your contribution and, and your part of your living legacy, which is a wonderful thing? You're getting to see your legacy borne out. I feel I've been lucky because I've had a lot of opportunities that have been presented to me and that I may have picked them up and done it in the right way by chance. But I don't feel that I've been particularly clever. I just feel that I've been fairly normal. I feel that I've been very lucky to have the opportunities that I got from my parents and other things and living in the wartime and and the opportunities to do in sport and various things that happened, the doors that opened at some times, not because I opened them, because they just sort of came open and somehow I could walk through them. And so I feel very lucky and I don't feel, I mean, I, I get a lot of uh, people making positive comments sometimes about, oh, well, you've, you've done this and you've done that and you've done that and that. I, I, I've said, look, that's not important. You know, we can all do this. I'm, I don't think I'm special in any way about what I've done. I just happen to have responded to the circumstances in the next way, and I've learned something from that, and then there's the next step. And I think we can all do that in our life. And I think we, we spend too much time wanting older, knowledgeable people to give us the answer. We have to find the answers ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that you and I have talked about, as, as you know, John, is, is obviously the wonderful organisation you were involved with some 10, 15 years ago, Be The Change, and, and you and I have often said yeah. and spoken about, for me, it's not about the coaching profession being the change, it's not even about leading the change, it's about leading the charge, yeah. because sometimes it feels a bit passive to me. What's mm. your view on you know, you know, coaching becoming more of an activist? Well, it's, it's very interesting because I think there is a, this thing that I mentioned in that article I wrote, which was denial. Unfortunately, a lot of people, when they feel uncomfortable, they'd rather not talk about it and they want to push it on one side and then go on doing what they feel comfortable with. I think there's a difficulty of people needing to be comfortable. It's interesting, different cultures have different ways of doing it. Some cultures are actually enjoy the challenge of uh, something new happening and that sort of thing. And fortunately, I know some of those people and uh, uh, that have been contributing to my life because they have been pioneering people who have the courage to do that. And I think, unfortunately, we are not, um, we are not doing that enough. I think our, our social structure I mean, I, I have mentioned before that, I mean, the capitalist coach social structure, I don't think is a healthy social structure. I'm not suggesting we should all be communists because those are only two ways of organizing how you arrange a society. There are probably 500 different ways that we could organize our society. 
And I just think that, that capitalism was not a good one and co communism wasn't a good one. And there are many other things we could do. And we need to be inventive and creative and find new ways. One thing that is really essential that I think a lot of people are not good at, and this is partly because of their education, is we have to be what we call whole system thinkers. We have to think of the contextual as well as the content of the different situations. So, um, yes, I don't feel particularly uh, clever. I feel lucky. And I've had a great life, and I want to contribute to other people exploring it uh, and having the courage to explore it, because it's not very scary when you actually get out there and do it anyway, you know. <laughs> well, look, John, it's been a genuine, absolute pleasure. And I really appreciate you sharing your insights and wisdom and stories. So thank you. Well, I hope it's useful to you and to other people, if they can do. Thank you, John. Okay, you're very welcome.